I'm sure that we are all learned in the word. Okay. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. Let's go Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. It says, you already, for though by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles. See, man is very weak. Ma I told you last week, right? Like Peter, we have to repeat some things. I told you, people don't mind eating biryani a hundred times. But if you say the same thing a hundred times, they get very irritated. Like if you tell them the first principles, if you tell them the thing that they need discipline in, they will get very irritated. Right? But then they can indulge in the pleasures hundred times. They do it, no problem. So here Paul is saying, for though by this time you ha already have to be teachers, yet you need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. That is the problem with many people. They have not matured or blossomed to understand the greater things of the gospel. They have not matured or blossomed to see the kingdom need. Okay? They have not. And I will address it today. So, many of us are also like that right now here. Even though at this time we, need, we can all actually stand up, pray for somebody. At this time we should actually stand up and we can also preach. At this time we can actually stand up and we can, we can do something. We can pray for the people that we are encountering with and tell them the things about God. But still, you know, we find ourselves in fear. So here Paul says, um, therefore, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, okay, actually, let's, let's read, read chapter 5, verse 13 also. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. That's very important. For everyone who partakes only still in the milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is still a Maturity can be seen, right? I can say, auntie, you are the, you are the one who has experienced life and you can say maturity can be seen, it can be heard. It is in the way that people can dress. It is in the way that people will greet. It is in the way that people show hospitality. It is in the way that people will welcome you into their house. It is in the way that people will offer you something, help. Maturity is in the way that people will keep quiet because they are not insecure about themselves. Maturity is a thing that you can experience and you can see. So everyone who partakes only still in the milk is still a babe. For they are, they are unskilled in the word of un uh, righteousness. Ne next verse. Verse 14. Very important also. It says, uh, But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is those who by reason, underline by reason, of use of their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. By reason, meaning... By, by purpose, by their mental capacities, exercise to discern both good and evil. These are the people who are you, I hope. These are the people who are all of you who sit here, work out the principles of the Bible. The Bible says, schools don't teach us much, okay? If you boil down what schools teach you, schools teach you only problem solving. That's why you have maths and you have problems. They teach you the principle of problem solving. When you grow up and you come to do computer engineering, they have a concept called if, then, and. You know that? if You, you all know if, then, and else. What is if, then, and else? Is the, isn't that also problem solving? Right? If the equation is right, then you do something. If the equation is wrong, else, then you go to else. Right? That's the, that's the basic thing, right? So there's only left or right. So if, if you're going to else, then, then there's some problem. So you have to do something. Like always, always, always in school, they teach you problem solving. And then they teach you to search for your own answers. So when you go home and you're studying for exam, what are you doing? You're searching the answers. You turn the pages. You find the right answer. You match the following. That's what you're doing, right? You're searching and you're sourcing. That is called research. You boil down your entire school life. Those are the two things that you're doing. You're researching and you're solving problems. If you learn these two things in school, researching and problem, so, uh, problem solving, that is enough to pave a very good way for you in your entire future. 
that is enough you don't need to learn pythagoras's theorem you don't need to understand all social studies and understand history you just need to learn two things you need to learn problem solving and to how to do your own research so they're not pythagoras theorem so when there was this guy do you, how many of you know tutankhamun have you heard this word tutankhamun see tutankhamun is a pharaoh in egypt so they found so they were archaeologists what is the job of archaeologists archaeologists dig right they dig and then they dug egypt and egypt was full of wealth egypt was so much full of wealth there was so much money in egypt and because there was so much money in egypt people were very curious about egypt okay but egypt's text the way that egyptians would write was something called hieroglyphics or something like that okay hieroglyphics or if you can tell me that word properly hieroglyphic glyphics something like that and nobody knew what were these writings okay i'm coming to a point nobody understood what are these he like it's a, it's a language that nobody understood so people never really understood what egyptians did in their life they never really understood how they did cultivation they never really understood and until one point where one archaeologist he found something called the rosetta stone it is still in the british museum i think till now he found something called the rosetta stone and the rosetta stone has the same thing it has one law it has one rule that was given by a local king at that point and that law was very uh, very strong and very big and that law was written in three languages one was in egyptian hieroglyphics or whatever that is and then it was written in greek and some other language and these two languages man knew so this is the first time that they can match the languages this is the first time that they man can deduce what this egyptian word means what are these words the, the meaning of these words so this is the first time that they man actually ca came to understand the language of egyptians and then they understood that out of all the kings that they have found there remains one more king who is not buried in these kings places listen carefully okay out of all the kings that they have found in the valley of the kings all the tombs and the mummies there was one king and his name is tutankhamun that guy is not there so obviously curiosity killed the cat right so this guy was like henry carter he is the ar archaeologist he says i need to find this tutankhamun only because he could not find it till now that is the only sole driving reason to find tutankhamun so they dig they dig they dug for 5 years nobody found it and by chance some shepherd somehow found the entrance to tutankhamun's tomb and he said hey i found some small entrance here why don't you come and check it out and then the archaeologists came and then they started digging meaning they started researching and once they dug they found a big tomb the biggest tomb until today a coffin within a coffin a coffin within a coffin a three coffin layered mummy made out of solid gold with gold everywhere and right now if you weigh the worth of tutankhamun's wealth it is in the billions and you know what sourced that billions of dollars find curiosity it is a solid man who is hungry to find something a man with a desire to learn a man with a desire to discover that is the man so you come to hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 it says therefore leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of christ let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards god why are you still in the basics some people they believe god but they are still not baptized some people they believe god but they don't act like it you have to progress into the next you have to find for what you do not yet have you have to find the things of the solutions that you need many of us just learn to live with the problems because they have stopped seeing the solutions isaiah chapter 60 verse 4 many people just enjoy and live with the problems because they think the problems are part of life no not according to the bible this is a solution that is there hidden for you like the tomb of tutankhamun away from all the worldly principles away where it you only only you have to dig it out and you have to find out 
I can stand here and I can preach 10,000 sermons, but unless you go and dig, it will not come to fruition. So, he says, let us leave the dead works. Now I want to show you another very, very, very important verse. It is verse 7. It says, for the earth, for the earth, the earth is everybody, right? Every rich man, poor man, fat man, thin man, short man, tall man, huh? an educated man, an illiterate man. Everybody lives on the earth. So for the earth drinks in the rain that often comes upon it. And it bears two kinds of things. It bears herbs useful by whom it is cultivated and it receives blessing. And the second kind it bears is thorns. The same earth bears two kinds of fruit. There are the same rain. And you see in verse 7 it says, the rain that often comes upon it. Meaning, God is not giving you one chance. God is giving you rain every season. God is giving you rain every the other day. And yet, if you don't bear herbs that are useful for cultivation, you are not the blessed of the Lord. See, see, I'll tell you, okay, very interesting revelation for me here. It says, those who bear fruits, herbs, after bearing herbs, they receive blessing. The blessing is not the herbs. This herbs is your work. There is two kinds of work. See, there is two kinds of work in the Bible. One work is to achieve salvation. We cannot do any work to achieve salvation. Salvation is a free gift. But then the Bible says, we are saved unto good works. Meaning after salvation, God will no longer measure you on your sin anymore. But God will start measuring you on your good works. He will say, what good did you do? Understand? He will not ask you an account of what all bad things you did. God does not care about all the bad things you did because that's the, the cross's problem and the cross solved that problem. Press, I think you put mine in 25 and theirs in 20. But fine, no problem, okay? So anyway, so what am I saying? The cross's problem is the works of salvation. The cross's problem is the works of salvation. But when you go to judgment in heaven, when you go to judgment in heaven, it's okay, concentrate, guys, look at me. When you go to heaven, the judgment's problem is your good works after salvation. What kind of cultivation did you do? What did you do with the time that you have? Did you look at the vision that God gave you? Did you look and gather people unto you? Did you look and did you pray unto them? For rain came upon you every season. Understanding? Are you understanding? For rain that often comes from the earth drinks the rain that often comes upon it. Meaning every Sunday there is rain coming from me here. On your WhatsApp or on your Instagram you see somebody or the other puts up a status of the word of God. Rain is coming into your life. Somebody or the other on Instagram preaches the word of God. Rain is coming into your life often. And yet, if you do not cultivate it and bear fruits that are useful, there is no receiving of the blessing of God. You will be saved. I will show you another verse that I did not plan on showing. <clears throat> First Corinthians, I think. Yeah, First Corinthians 3, 5. 1 Corinthians 3 5. I'm coming with. So remember what I'm saying, right? You are all supposed to be inspired to do some good work. You are all supposed to not be lazy. If you hang around lazy people, you will also become lazy. Right? 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 5. That's not the one. 3.15. Yeah. Th I, will, I will show you 3.9. Okay? For we are all God's fellow workers. Verse 9. 
for we are all God's fellow workers. And you are God's field and you are God's building. Next verse. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. There is a salvation principle that has been laid. Look at me. There is a principle that Paul has already laid. And he calls that foundation Jesus. He calls that foundation grace. The salvation principles have been laid. Nobody can shake it. The salvation principles have been laid. The principles of grace have been laid. Okay? The principles of grace have been laid. The work of the foundation is finished. But another fellow builds on it. You build on it. Auntie builds on it. Sushma builds on it. Jeffy builds on it. Rishi builds on it. I build on it. Deepak builds on it. Not Deepak. Well, Babji builds on it. We all have our own building. That's why it says verse 9. God is the foundation. We are the fellow workers and we, God is the field and we are God's fields and in we are God's buildings. We are the one that build it. Go to the next verse. And then it says, but each one take heed how he builds it. Last part of verse 10 it says, but let each one take heed. Be careful how you build it. Next verse. It says, for no foundation can lay anyone, okay, other than the, okay, see, the foundation is settled, the foundation is Christ. It is only the matter of what is being built above the foundation. Okay, next one. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, and hay and straw, people can build with these options. They can build with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay and straw. Next verse. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Next verse. If anyone's work which was built endures, he will receive a... If you do good work that bears good useful herbs, that cultivates something that is good, you receive then a blessing. If your work is useless, next say, if anyone's work is burnt, he will suffer loss. Yet he himself will be saved. Yet so as through fire. That guy will be saved just like that. You know, just, just, just barely. Just barely. There was this one time I was driving to uh, Siddipet or something for ministry. And our car was very fast. We were going very fast. The road is wide open. I can see to like probably two kilometers forward. And then there was a truck in front of me. There is a truck in front of me. The truck is minding its own business. And then there is a car in front of me. This car is minding his own business. We are all going minding our own business. Suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere, a cow walked into the road. And we cannot see that cow, you know. The, the, because the divider was full of bushes, okay. The divider was full of bushes. And from the bushes a cow came. Now this truck slammed the brakes. The guy's reaction behind the truck was a swift. He went left and by the time the truck slammed the brake and this guy was here, the cow was here. Where do I go? On the right there is a truck, on the left there is a swift. Where do I go? I am very fast. And then the cow is coming more to the left. Now if I want to go next to the swift, I am only going to hit the cow. So there were literally no options for me. So I did the unthinkable. I went between the swift and the lorry. My dad's both side mirrors gone. The sound, I thought I hit something. I thought we were going to die that day. Just barely escaped. Just barely. Two inches this guy was to my right or the truck was to my right or the cow did not go. Something bad would have happened that day. Something bad. Just barely. When you are saved with no good works to show for. There is no blessing in your life. Meaning, your children are not blessed. Your parents are not blessed. Your friends are not blessed. Your friends are not saved. Nobody through you have received anything. So when you go to heaven, you receive nothing. 
but the person who does go from milk to food milk to chicken chicken to mutton a person who goes from one level to another level a person who goes from one work to another work the more he works the lord blesses him the lord that's why the bible says all the things that you do with your hand the labor of your hands i will bless if you are without labor if you are without any work god will not bless you okay so that's hebrews chapter come now again let's go hebrews chapter 6 let's go back to my main message <coughs> hebrews chapter 6 so earth uh, what happens for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it bears herbs useful by whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from her but if it bears thorns and briers it is rejected and near to being cursed and and end is to be burned now come to verse 11 verse 11 actually verse 10 also if you see it says now god therefore is not unjust to forget your labor of love for god is not unjust to forget your work labor of love which you have shown towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and still do minister some people don't understand the gospel and yet there are some people who will still go and pray for them who will still do the cultivation work who will still do the rewarding seeking work who will still try to cultivate good fruit god is not unjust to forget all of that that's why he says in verse 11 it says therefore we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish and im- imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and patience those who through faith and patience those who through faith and patience inherited the promises now i want to show you hebrews chapter 4 actually verse 3 hebrews chapter 3 you see hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 it says therefore brethren let us be aware hebrews chapter 3 i'm showing you a couple of verses but please If you have time you can go back home and listen to these. So I don't like to preach point by point. I like to preach a lesson that you can go back and remember that you can boil down to one or two words in your heart. See it says beware brethren that there in any of you be an evil heart of unbelief. Evil heart is not a sinful heart. Evil heart is not a blemished heart. Evil heart is a heart of unbelief an unbelieving heart is an evil heart <laughs> beware brother lest there be in any of you an evil heart of an unbelief in departing from the living god next verse verse 12 but exhort one another daily while it's called today let therefore okay fine that's not there uh, come to verse 19 same chapter verse 19 so we uh, actually 18 and 19 can you put some sorry 18 and and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but to those who did not obey if you want to see that in another translation you can see can you put it up in nlt it says and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but to those who did not obey those who are of an unbelieving heart god promised see here it is and to whom was god speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest wasn't it the people who disobeyed him the disobedience here is unbelieving the disobedience is unbelieving these people could not see the promised land these people could not they looked at the giants and they said we cannot win they looked at goliath and they said we cannot fight him they looked at a mountain and they said we cannot climb it they looked at a valley and they said it is impossible for us because they saw the valley to be greater than the god they looked at the red sea and they started complaining to moses they said moses have you brought here brought us here here to kill us they looked at the desert and they complained about chicken you understand what i'm saying they looked at their family situation they looked at their themselves they looked at their own life and instead of looking at how big god is they kept concentrating on how big their problem is 
and therefore god said your unbelieving evil heart you will not enter into my rest and to whom was god speaking wasn't it to the people who with disobedience of unbelief the reason christians stay 100 years the way that they are staying now is because they cannot fathom to believe the scope of the greatness of god if a pastor drives a bmw they will say this pastor is stealing them people's money no this pastor is stealing what you were supposed to steal from the devil he unlocked that rest you did not people stopped praying for healing people stopped praying for breakthrough people stopped praying for all of this rather they just live with their problem and they say lord give me strength no why can't you pray for the problem to go away next verse 19 so we see that they could not enter the rest because of their unbelief we see that because of their unbelief they were unable unable to enter his rest they were unable the biggest barrier in the life of any christian is his unbelief and maybe we look at ourselves and think oh my god i have so much unbelief maybe we look at ourselves and say wah i have so much unbelief that's why i wanted to show you romans uh, mark chapter 3 come to mark chapter 3 mark chapter 3 actually mark chapter 11 sorry mark chapter 11 <coughs> i will show you how to fight this unbelief i will show you two examples right now and the first of which is mark you all understood right that the biggest you un, you understand the kind and the magnitude of the problem of unbelief laddu you understand you understand that unbelief can basically destroy the future you understand so what are you believing for future is not just her <laughs> okay mark chapter 11 verse 22 So Jesus said have faith in uh, this verse just irritates me this verse give you know like an this verse makes me want to hatch out of some kind of a metaphorical egg it says have faith in God there is so much power in just that one verse that is the advice that Jesus is saying have faith in God You see a mountain you see a valley you see a desert you see a red sea but then in spite of all of that have faith in god have faith in god have faith in god next verse very important for assuredly i say to you whoever says to this mountain see this is the formula of faith okay if you have a pen or a pencil mark your bibles this is the formula of faith how to have faith meaning how to overcome unbelief faith is the opposite of unbelief if you have unbelief if you have unbelief the opposite of unbelief is have faith in god have faith in god and the formula how to have faith in god is assuredly i say to you whoever says to this mountain be thou removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart unbelief is not doubting but believes again he words all that he says will be done he will have whatever he says therefore i say to you whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them if you deduce this key words from this there is one believe and there is three says Okay look at your bibles so all do how many believes are there one believe and how many says are there one two three four five guys this is ask four the formula to believe 
is to speak with the word. The formula for faith is to release with your word. You understand? That is why God looked at the darkness and he said, let there be light. He just didn't believe in his heart. He spoke with his. Because the formula for faith is the believing heart will become a speaking mouth. That's why when David was going to kill Goliath, he knew he can kill him. He said, you uncircumcised, uncovenanted giant. You come with me and threaten the God of Israel. How dare you? I am going to kill you and feed you to the dogs. These are the vision that he first saw before killing Goliath. And he did what he first already saw. You understand what I'm saying? Understand? He first saw himself already killing Goliath. And then he runs to him with his mouth wide open, speaking the things of God. And the speaking proves his believing. The formula of faith. Have faith in God. How? Before you asking how God already told you. Whatever you say, believe in your heart. And all that you say, when you say it, you will have it. So if you have unbelief, I want you to say, I have faith in God. As you say, I have faith in God, your unbelief will become smaller. That is, I am telling you, the creation will start acknowledging your words. Your doubt will start acknowledging your words. Which is true. See, the world, world, what it does, you know, it, uh, how many of you watched this triple R movie? All of us watched, right? I watched this triple R movie. You read the Bible and you watch Triple R. Most of the things are from the Bible. He will tell uh, the, about NTR or something. He will tell this man is like a shepherd. He will come for his Gorel Kapari. He will come. Uh, who, is the go who is the shepherd? Jesus is the shepherd. It's a biblical thing. Huh? It's a biblical principle. He will come and he will rescue. Right? And then there is another thing this... Uh, in the fight will happen, this NTR will come with 100 animals. You saw, NTR with all of his power, he'll come with 100 animals. And then he will go on fight. You know who fought with 100 animals in the Bible? Samson. He's angry with one of these kings and then he takes foxes. And in fact, NTR will also have fire in his hand and the animals. The world will take inspiration from the word of God. That is the absolute benchmark. Absolute benchmark. Even Gandhi took. So the, the principles of karma and the principles of the world of universe and this consciousness and mantras and all of these are principles that have been taken by, from the Bible and corrupted or perverted or twisted. So mantras and all of these, you know, in fact, Hindus really re uh, find these holy, uh, these cows very holy, right? They rever these cows so much. When Moses went up onto the mountain and when Aaron and all of these guys were downstairs, downstairs I'm saying, under the mountain, uh, they, they, what did they do? They formed a golden calf. Where are these, where do Hindus, Hindus find their traits? From the Aryans. Sanskrit came from the, where did these Aryans come from? They were Western Europeans. No, Eastern Europeans. They were traveling and they came. They carried these principles. Where did caste system come from? When jo Jacob calls and he lays hands on his 12 sons, he says, Levites, you are the priests. The caste system comes from the perversion of the Bible. Everything I'm telling you, right, you find, you find it, it is a perversion of the things of God. That's what the devil does. He twists the truth and he feeds you half-truth. He'll find Jesus and he'll ask, Jesus, if you really are the son of God, if you are, he is. If you are the son of God, jump from here. If you are really a true man of God, do this. If you are truly a son of God, change the bread into, uh, change the stone into bread. If you truly are the uh, son of God, worship me and bow down, something like that, all this nonsense he'll be talking. He will be challenging you so that he can try to twist the perfection that God has intended. So don't think that this is a mantra principle. I am teaching a mantra. No. I am teaching you the truth. 
which is in the Bible, written here, encoded for you and for me. But the world has twisted it. And when we come back, it's too hard for us to recognize that, yeah, this was already in the Bible 2,000 years ago. So how can you beat unbelief, Laddu? How can you beat unbelief? By? By speaking. How can you beat unbelief? By speaking. How many times should you speak it? You should speak it three times more, at least four times more than you believe it. You find something you are able to, unable to have unbelief. Uh, unable to have belief. There are some things, I will give you a small story and I will close. Okay, actually, I wanted to show you the second example, right? Come to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. I'm showing you how to beat your unbelief because unbelief is a problem. James chapter 5, verse 17. James chapter 5, verse 17. James chapter 5, verse 17. <coughs> it says, now, uh, verse five, 15, can you put from 15? It says, now the fervent and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. The prayer of faith, again, have faith in God, the prayer of faith. What is the prayer of faith? Go to the next verse. Next verse, 17. It says, Elijah was a man. Is that the one? Yeah, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Meaning, I see, I told you the weakness of Elijah, right? Elijah, he was very discouraged because he did not find what he wanted materialized. He was a very fearful man. Understand the weight of this verse. We are sinful. It says Elijah was a nature like ours. Understand the principle. If God can use Elijah according to the verse, God can use you. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Next. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Can we read verse 16 and 16 and it says, The effective and the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective and the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now he's saying the Elijah's kind of prayer. What kind of prayer? Elijah kind of prayer. Two times Elijah prayed. See what are the two times Elijah prayed? Verse 17. First time he prayed for the rain to stop. It should not rain. Okay. It says then he prayed fervently. 17. Verse 17. He prayed earnestly. That is a very like what is the meaning of earnestly? Worked earnestly means with passionately. Like, so, like, do a lot of work. Like, that kind of thing, right? Okay. Verse 18, then, then he prayed again. Here, no earnest. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its. Okay, now I want to show you the prayer of Elijah. First Kings, chapter 17. First Kings, chapter 17. Verse 1. This is the prayer according to the James chapter 15 verse uh, 5 verse 17. This is the earnest thing, the, the prayer that Elijah earnestly prayed. This is the one. Chapter 17 verse 1. It says, As the Lord, of God, Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Apparently that was his prayer. Now you tell me, he says, the prayer of the uh, the prayer of faith will heal the sick and the effective fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much and the example is the example of elijah earnestly praying and then when we see to study what kind of earnest prayer elijah prayed it looks like elijah was not really praying he was speaking <laughs> understand so how difficult is it for a man to say, as surely as the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain until except at my word all these years. Does it seem like a prayer? It's only like a few words, right? Then when you see, this is, this is the earnest prayer. This prayer is the prayer of earnestness. Means, apparently this is the one that has passion. 
Okay, then go to the next verse. Elijah will come after many days. And then, chapter 18, verse 41. Chapter 18, verse 41, 42. Actually read from 41. It says, Elijah said, Ahab, go drink up, go up and drink because there is a sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah bowed down, went up to the top of Carmel and bowed his head down on the grease ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go and look towards the sea. So he went and he looked, there is nothing. And seven times he did that again, go again. Then it came to pass on the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud, a small cloud, the size of a fish that is rising up. The earnest prayer did not find Elijah bowing his knees, putting his head between his knees, kneeling down and praying. The earnest prayer found Elijah standing up, probably hands in his pocket, telling to Ahab, Ahab, assuredly I say to you, with the witness of the God before whom I stand, the God of Israel, there shall be no rain nor dew until except at my word all these years. That was his earnest prayer. And then you contrast it to the not so earnest prayer. He was on his knees with the face between his knees, kneeling down, bowing down completely in a posture. That is what we find very reverent. And then he prayed, he prayed seven times for that rain. That was not so earnest. We understand that faith is in the authority of your speaking. You understand, God will show it to you. Faith is in the authority of your prayer, in your speaking. Faith exists, belief exists in the authority of your speaking. And the world will come and change itself to align itself to what the man of God or the woman of God or the child of God is speaking. The world will align itself, not you. The world will shift itself, not you. Recently, my one of our church members wanted to buy a property. And this property is very expensive. It's not small property. It's big, massive. So he, his father recently passed away. And then we were having some kind of conversation and then my father goes to talk to the seller. And the seller is big, okay? The seller is not just any seller. I have never seen a seller, like I have never been part of a transaction that is that big. And the seller was big. Out of After the whole transaction, the seller comes to my dad, rich man, very big man, very, 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 very big man. He says, Pastor, He's not even a believing Christian. He says, Pastor, can you lay your hands on my head and pray for me? It will bless me. And he bowed down. Christians today don't have the faith that that man had. We go there in a broken small car. He is there with a S-class Maybach. Massive, massive. I could not believe my eyes. He's probably a man who plays with crores that is floating between his fingers. We are small men. But when you go with the name of God on you, he bowed down. Imagine. I asked myself, if I was that rich, would I bow down? And I asked somebody, please lay your hand on me. Pray for me. My dad prayed for him. That is faith. Is to speak what you want. Is to speak and confess. Ask what you want. Change your heart. And the world will align to make itself come. You know how you know how we got how much we got the deal for? He sold that property to us below his making cost. Like below his landing cost he sold. He told us, right? He showed us the numbers. He said, Pastor, only for you. I am not selling it for a business. I am selling it so that I can have the blessing of God. He sold that to us for cost that is far lower than his own landing cost. Meaning this man does not care for money. And 
And then I realized, wow, there exists faith. The difference is there exists faith out of Christianity. So the effective fervent prayer is a prayer of speaking. Jesus says, have faith in me. The faith says, speak. Say to this mountain, say to this mountain, say to this mountain. When you close your eyes, what do you see? Do you see the Red Sea that is far, far, far ahead of you? That's why when the storm rose up, these people will come to Jesus and they will say, Jesus, do you have no fear? Do you have no concern? Look at the storm. Looks like we are going to die. Looks like we are going to die. The storm is, bleat uh, the storm is beating the ship. The ship is going to break. Don't you understand, Jesus? Don't you have any care for us? And Jesus says, oh, you little. Oh, you of little. How long should I be with you? And then he looks to the storm and he says, Storm, be. That word stops creation. And creation bows down to that word. And he says, he has left the word in your heart. The Bible says that. My word is where? In your heart. Just release it, man. Put the word, put some action to the word. Put some shape to the word. Let it go out of your mouth. People are ashamed to speak what they believe. No. That is the good work that you are doing. Once you plough the land with your words, once you plough the field with your words, the Lord will send His amazing blessing. And instead of thorns and shrubs and all of those weeds, now suddenly good herbs are coming. And then the blessing of the Lord will come upon you. And when you look, your daughters and your sons will be coming towards you. And then you shall see. And then you shall see. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 5. And then you shall see. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 5. Then you shall see. He says 60 verse 5. Isaiah 65. You put it. And then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart will swell with joy. Because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. And the wealth of the Gentiles will come to you. When will you see? When you have already first seen in verse 4. When will you see? When you speak it, what you see inside of your heart. When will you see and your heart will become joyful and you will become radiant? When you already have first seen. How many of you understood? Understand? I understood. What did you understand? To speak. Don't shout at me. Don't shout at your friends. Don't shout at your family. Shout in the face of the enemy. Speak to that enemy. Okay? Let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. Okay? I want you to remember, look at that mountain and keep speaking to that mountain. Next week I will ask you, how many of 